Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Association of the United States Army's annual meeting and trade show in Washington, D.C. Our coverage here is sponsored by AM General, Elbit Systems of America, General Motors Hydrotech, L3 Technologies, and Leonardo DRS. And we have with us retired United States Army Major General Dennis Moran, who is uh, the Vice President uh, for DoD Business at uh, Radio Maker Communications Giant Harris. Sir, great seeing you again. Good. Vago, thank you very much for stopping by. Um, it's it's a pleasure. Um, you know, each one of these shows is an opportunity for every country company to uh, highlight you know what what their uh, focus areas are for the coming year. Talk to us a little bit about you know what you guys are talking about. I know that uh, tactical radio's feature is big on in this. Uh, there's been this sense that tactical radio business is dead and it's anything but dead. Correct. So talk yeah. to us a little bit about what are sort of you know the the two three four things that you guys are, are really featuring here. Well, the the. The, the key thing that we're doing is is showing the Army that we're more than tactical radios. And, and certainly our night vision offerings, bringing in the new technology of white phosphorus into that area, which has brand new concepts and brand new ideas of how you can look and see in the dark. That's certainly an area that we're highlighting. Also behind me is the uh, our T7 uh, counter IED robot. We have just recently won an award in UK and so we're bringing that technology into the United States. We're also highlighting our electronic warfare capability both in rotary wing and also um, uh, UAVs. That's a, a needed capability that the, that the Army has identified as they rebuild their uh, as they rebuild their EW programs. And certainly, you know, the, the last thing that we're featuring is our, you know, what are we doing in, in satellite communications? Both the, the big antennas, you know, the, the, the MET program that we offer into the Army, and also our smaller radios, our smaller uh, satellite systems that we offer. Um, and I have to tell our uh, viewers, and I have to apologize, we still haven't posted a great video that we shot while we were at DSEI, where the robot itself helped me interview the person who'd come up with the robot, which was which was a lot of fun. So folks, stay tuned. That'll be up, and, and we'll we'll cross-link these interviews. Um, let me ask you about Win-T. I mean, you guys, uh, you know, had, has been an important part, uh, important program for the United States Army. General Dynamics is the prime contractor. You guys are the high-frequency radio provider on that program, high-capacity radio pro provider. Um, its days are numbered mm -hmm. at this point. So talk to us about, you know, what do you see as lessons learned and what do you think is going to be coming next and what's your position on that going to be? Well, I think there's two things. I mean, number one, it, we have to acknowledge that the, you know, the, the Win-T program would really came out of communications needs in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the, there's an acknowledgement that those kinds of communications, satellite-based communications, are not what we're going to need in a more contested environment. That said, there is a lot of good things that are being delivered in the Win-T Increment 2 program. And I think what the Army is going to do, in coordination with General Dynamics and others in industry, is redefine the architecture, understand what industry can provide in the very near term, and then incorporate those things into the, uh, into the program. I think the most important thing the Army's got to do now, right now is articulate the requirement so they can convince Congress that the changing of the funding lines that uh, General Crawford presented just a couple of weeks ago in the defense committees is the wise thing to do. And and what do you see your role being in that? I mean, you know, do you, you know, what, what role do you guys expect to play in that? And do you think that if there's a recompete, for example, you try to go after that as a prime, for example? On well, that? I think it's way too early to tell, you know, what our, you know, what the acquisition strategy is going to be for any kind of a follow-on. That said, I do think that we have technology that we that we offer into the program currently that we have the opportunity to make improvements on. And the other thing that we are experts on, which I think is going to be very positive both for the tactical radios and the future of Win-T, is how do you interface those programs technically so that information flows seamlessly from the tactical radios up into the higher headquarters. Um, uh, uh, you guys have prided yourselves on always being guys who invest, uh, and uh, the NIEs, uh, we've, we've talked about many, many times for many years, those are the network integration exercises the Army has been conducting. Um, a concern was, you know, how much longer companies would keep participating in that if they don't end up getting a lot of business out of it. Um, have you gotten any business out of it, and why are you continuing to participate in those NIEs? Well, the NIEs, and, and you and I have had these discussions over the years, you know, is always a great place for the Army to bring new capabilities 
hand them off to soldiers and find out do they or do they not work. From a Harris Corporation perspective, we've offered a number of mostly tactical radios into the NIE process and all of them have been adopted by the uh, by the army certainly the PRC 117 G's you know have been fielded inside the army the maneuver program the mid-tier network vehicular radio you know was tested out at NIE and it became a program of record so you know Harris has been maybe the odd one out but we've always saw that as an opportunity to get our technology into the you know in front of soldiers get those comments back and then convince the Army that our, the, the way that we're inserting technology you know, makes sense for the Army and for the soldier. Um, from an investment case standpoint, this, this will be the last uh, question. Um, how hard is it to make some of these investment decisions? And are you finding, you know, there were numerous examples, and you just mentioned some of them through the NIE process, how you guys have actually invested and gotten a reward, either in shaping the, the landscape or getting that great feedback. Um, how, how hard is it to make some of these investments in a very, very crowded field? You know, what's the process you guys use, the thinking you guys use, to determine how much investment to put against some of this stuff? Because if you look at it, especially for guys like you that are spread across so many different programs, that ends up becoming quite a challenge. Well, I think that, first of all, what's the size of the market? Um, and, you know, are there global implications for these kinds of capabilities? Because Harris is a global company, and we provide our capabilities and technologies across the world. I think that's number one. And then number two, can we really differentiate ourselves? Do we have a secret sauce? And if the answer is the market's right, we have the right capability, then we'll do the investment and then we'll bring the uh, the products to market. Let me ask you um, a connectivity question. Each one of the military services is working on its own architectures. Uh, General Goldfein, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, deserves, um, gets a lot of accolades for how he's thinking about his multi-domain mm -hmm. uh, command and control system. Uh, there are folks who say that he's ahead of the other services in thinking about it. Army's working on its own system, Navy's working on its own system. But a friend of mine who looks at this stuff from a joint perspective said, look, Look, the big error mistake we're making is we're not coordinating these. We're not interconnecting these systems. You guys work on that C2 piece of the equation, but also the comms piece of it. Is it as joined up as it should be, and what has to happen for it to be as cross-connected? Because a multi-domain battle awareness system is going to be much more powerful if it's bringing everybody into it, as opposed to just each one of the military services. Vago, that's a... That's a fantastic question, and I'm the right now we we are not seeing the leadership from the DoD, you know, on what direction we should take to ensure that we have the interoperability that you're describing. So how is Harris reacting to that? So we're looking at the the requirements, we're looking at the capabilities that each one of the services need. We acknowledge that there's the need for interoperability, and so we're bringing solutions forward that have applicability in the Air Force, in the Marine Corps in the Army, in SOCOM, in the Navy, and we're trying to convince our customer that moving in a particular direction is what makes best sense for the, for the warfighter. So I don't think that it's a technology question. I think it's more of a what's the policy, what are the operational requirements, and how are those being defined. I do think that we need stronger leadership from the, certainly from the joint staff, to define those, those requirements. But I think that industry, you know, certainly speaking for Harris, we see the need, we're doing the investment, and we're bringing those forward to the uh, to the customer. And what are some of the technologies that you think are enabling, right? You, you mentioned that we've got a couple of things that we've brought to their attention. What are those couple things that you think could help in this particular case? Well, you, you certainly have to have, you know, we've certainly learned from operations in Eastern Europe, you know, in Ukraine, that there is a need for waveforms, both in the air domain and in the ground domain, that can operate in, a, in an EW-challenged environment. So we're bringing those waveforms that work both in uh, fast-moving aircraft, rotary wing, and also, you know, ground forces, and acknowledging that they have to have interoperability between the, the two domains, the ground domain and the air domain. There's similar things that are happening in the maritime domain, predominantly on the surface, and the need for a battle group to, to, uh, to have of, um, low probability of intercept, low probability of detection, waveforms, you know, between ships. There's similarities in those technologies, whether you're on the ground, whether you're on the sea, and when you're in the air. And so we want to make investments that make sense 
to the company that offer solutions that will work interoperably in those different, uh, those different domains. Sir, thanks very much. It's always a pleasure talking to you and hope you have a great AUSA. We will. Thank you very much, Vago. All right, take care.